Eh, buenas tardes. Eh, good evening. Arasu and uh, Larisa. Buenas tardes a todas y todos. Eh, hoy es la tercera y última jornada de este ciclo que hemos hecho, realizado en torno a la exposición Wasteland y que trata sobre feminismos, narrativas y exilios, es decir, las narraciones de las artistas y la, sus memorias, sus uh, exilios también de sus países, como hemos visto anteriormente. Y hoy tenemos con uh, nosotras y con nosotros, tenemos a dos de las artistas de la exposición, para su Furujar, que es procedente de Irán y vive en uh, Alemania, en Frankfurt, y Larisa Sansur, procedente de Palestina y que vive en Londres. Bien, eh, les voy a hacer una serie de preguntas y ellas van a hacer esta narración eh, sobre sus países y sobre sus vidas y su, su arte y su actividad política y, y artística. Para Astu Furujar eh, nació en Teherán, Irán, y vive en el exilio en Frankfurt, en Alemania. Estudió arte en la Universidad de Teherán y posteriormente, cuando se trasladó a Alemania, obtuvo su grado en el College of Art Offenbach en 1994. Es hija de los escritores y activistas políticos Parvane Forujar y Darius Forujar, su padre, Darius, lideró el Hebmelat e Irán, un partido de oposición panarabista, oposición al régimen de la Tola Yomeini. Sus padres fueron brutalmente asesinados en el otoño de 1998 en su casa de Teherán. Forujar y su hermano se involucraron en el activismo después de que sus padres fueran asesinados y no les fue permitido por el régimen llorar o hablar públicamente acerca de sus muertes. En 1994, Parastú fue considerada por el régimen iraní una amenaza y se trasladó a Alemania. En la actualidad, ella sigue, aunque reside en Alemania, pero guarda la casa de sus padres y continúa yendo a Irán, donde tiene abiertos varios juicios porque es considerada una, un peligro para el régimen por su actividad artística y es considerada como blasfema por usar signos propios de la, de la religión. Y, por, y también como por, por su activismo, digamos, político, es una, está, está, siendo, está en un proceso de, de juicio. En 2012 recibió el premio Sophie von la Roche en reconocimiento a su trabajo, que confronta cuestiones de género, la identidad, y los, la política y los desplazamientos. Como han visto, eh, su obra trata el tema de la tortura, y la, la, este, este espacio, digamos, oculto en que el poder ejerce la violencia sobre los cuerpos. Su trabajo comprende diversos medios, desde intervenciones e instalaciones, la animación, los dibujos digitales, ella trabaja por eh, ordenador, la fotografía, los signos propios de la cultura persa, como la, la propia caligrafía, como las miniaturas y los objetos. Utiliza eh, motivos que son específicamente culturales de la tradición iraní para desarrollar este trabajo formal y crítico con las políticas iraníes. Entre sus exposiciones temporales destacan en la Hamburger Bahnhof de Berlín, el Museo für Gegenwart de Berlín y ha participado en exposiciones colectivas en Alemania como el Frauenmuseum de Bonn, el Museum of Modern Art de Frankfurt o Haus der Kultur in der Welt en Berlín o Jewish Museum de Australia o San Francisco. 
Después eh, presentaré a Larisa Sansur y, o bien quizás, eh, para, para no cargar demasiado las biografías, pero quizás pasaré mejor a las preguntas. Eh, Larisa Sansur ha nacido en Jerusalén y vive y trabaja en Londres. Estudió Bellas Artes en Londres, Nueva York y Copenhague. Y su trabajo es multidisciplinar y discurre en torno al diálogo político actual a través de diferentes lenguajes como el vídeo, la instalación, la fotografía, el formato libro e eh, internet. El eje central de su obra es el enfrentamiento entre la ficción y la realidad y la dicotomía de pertenecer y ser extraída de un territorio y de una, una tierra propia. Su trabajo incluye referencias a géneros tan diversos como la ciencia ficción, el spaghetti western y las películas de terror que convergen con la política de Oriente Medio y los problemas sociales para producir intrincados universos paralelos en los que un nuevo sistema de valores puede ser decodificado. Sus exposiciones individuales más recientes incluyen el culto Huset de Estocolmo, la Depo en Estambul, Photographic Center de Copenhague, eh, Turku Art Museum de Finlandia, Laurisa Bibi de Dubai, etc. Y su trabajo se ha mostrado en las Bienales de Busan, Corea del Sur, Estambul y Liverpool. Después proyectaremos un vídeo de Larisa titulado In the Future, I Will Eat from the Finest Porcelain. Uh, welcome. Para Stu and Larissa, and thank you, thank you to be here with uh, us and uh, to talk about uh, your art and your narrative and memories and your political and artistic uh, action. I would like uh, Para Stu to ask uh, about uh, the motivation of your work uh, mm -hmm. since uh, you left uh, Iran and your experience. Uh, Mm -hmm. your, your political experience because you lived such a trauma with, uh, mm -hmm. with, uh, with your parents and uh, how it pro this event uh, produced uh, your, mm -hmm. your work, uh, influenced yeah. your work on all your life. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I would go a little bit uh, uh, earlier as I started to Uh, study art in Iran. It was uh, uh, early in the 80s and it was uh, uh, short after the revolution. Uh, the revolution itself, uh, I experienced it as a 16 years old uh, 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 woman, young woman, and it was a time of uh, great ideas. A time of illusion, a time that you thought um, you are part of a great movement that would change the land to a better country, F uh, more freedom and uh, more equality. Uh, but, uh, and of course, was el one element was essential, the religion. But many people like my family or many, many dissidents, even from lefties or uh, uh, in another um, directions, they thought of religion as some kind of cultural inheritance. They didn't think of religion as, as an ideology. But as the religious people gained the power, they understood it as their own ideology and they started to Uh, somehow repress the others. And uh, that was the beginning of a very horrible time of repression and uh, mass uh, 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 executions. And it was really a horrible shock. My father was arrested. My, uh, a lot of friends of my parents were arrested or had to leave the country. So the normal life was hardly damaged. Mm -hmm. And 
I was just an 18 years old uh, uh, young woman who had lost uh, th these wonderful ideas. So I had to shift to think in another kind of sphere. So I started to go, uh, I, I started to study art and um, chose this area as, uh, pl as a place to think about the problematic, think about the conflicts and try to deal with it, not in a directly political way, but uh, in another way, you try to use uh, and find, define another space for myself as it was uh, common in my family. My, I come from a dissident family and the main topics were always politics and uh, resistance against the um, dictatorship. So that is how I came up with uh, studying art. And um, I studied in Tehran University. It was not really an uh, easy time because it was the time of a very ideological uh, um, uh, that the government was um, all over. So uh, it was really um, a, um, a not a free time. Uh, and studying art was also not that easy because it, there was a lot of boundaries. But anyway, at the end of these studies, I thought that uh, I want to get out of the country to live somewhere else, to experience another kind of being and life and uh, also to learn uh, another way of looking at art. So I um, went to Germany and uh, that was at the beginning also not that easy because it was a cultural shock. <laughs> and, uh, but with the time I, um, I managed to uh, study there, I became a member of an artist collective. That was mm -hmm. the time of artist collectives in uh, Europe. And um, this working together with another artist, uh, trying to understand what are the differences and what are the similarities. And uh, that was some kind of looking back at myself, thinking about memories, thinking about uh, belonging, how, how much do you belong here or there. And that was the time that I um, started to, to, to recognize myself as a, as, a, as a person in between. That is something that remained with me. Also, if I have been living now for more than 20 years in Germany, I still cannot say I'm a German, but I'm not an Iranian anymore as I was, used to be. I'm a person in between. I'm a hybrid person belonging to different cultures. And what has been very uh, um, a gift to me was that I was an artist because the, this space in between, I define it with my work. That is where I work in and it is empty if I don't work, but if I start to work with it, if I, it, I cultivate it, and in that sense it becomes a, uh, a place that I belong to. It's a place of exile or migration or in between, uh, you can call it in different terms, but that is the space that I belong to and I, my, I, and my creativity deals with this space in between. Mm -hmm. And as you said, um, I was uh, in Germany as my parents who were um, activists, very famous activists in Iran, were killed in um, their own home. That's the home where I 
spent all my childhood in that's our home. So also thinking about um, how can a home where you have beautiful, safe memories become the place of the murder of your parents. Mm -hmm. That is this very contradiction situation that I had to deal with. And uh, as we were going through the exhibition, you mm -hmm. were uh, again and again saying that the, these are women who resist so resistance gives you the power to, to deal with such a uh, biography. And I think, uh, so I started to, not only as an artist, but also as activist, I um, keep on going to Iran, for example. It is now 18 years. The government forbids me to... Um, have a commemoration, a, a gathering at the, um, at the day of my parents' death. But I keep on every year going there, announcing that I want to have a, a, um, a gathering at their home uh, to remember them. They barricade the whole street, they don't allow it, but I keep on going. And every time that I go, they, they, everybody or uh, people, uh, many people, uh, remember what has happened. Yeah. So it is about also the some kind of um, remembering becomes an act of resistance. Yeah. And that is uh, how I try to deal with it. And also in my artistic work, of course, it has uh, any artist uh, work with, uh, with uh, themes that becomes uh, existential. And for me, uh, dealing with the political situation, criticizing the uh, structures of power, uh, has become more and more existential. And uh, also trying to understand this simultaneity of uh, life being beautiful and at the same time so violent. And that is the experience, that is something that I uh, examine <coughs> in my work and also represent so that the visitors, uh, the concipients would understand it and they would deal with the moment that of simultaneity of beauty and violence, horror and beauty. So that is, uh, in that <coughs> term, I think they understand it more deeply mm -hmm. than uh, uh, because you, you go through this contradiction as a person. Um, uh, were there uh, some associations in uh, Iran or in other countries who uh, supported you when you wanted to leave the country? No, actually. No. Was you actually. absolutely alone and you, yes. did, you, did you leave yeah. by your one? Uh, okay. And uh, uh, can you make a relation between um, the actual situation? Mm -hmm. what is happening in Germany, for instance, with the uh, mm -hmm. refugees yes. coming from uh, Syria or other countries, and, uh, and your, your past, uh, mm -hmm. are you making a link, or how do you react uh, yeah. about it? Of course it is, uh, you know, um, of course, uh, if you have this experience of uh, coming uh, to a country as an immigrant or, or as a refugee, uh, searching for shelter somewhere else as your own country, it remains with you. And all the refugees coming to Europe uh, and the, their, um, what they go through, of course, it, it is some kind of me, myself, going through it again. It is... Uh, 
they are, most of them come also from the countries that, of my region. Mm -hmm. Most of them uh, um, speak the, somehow the familiar language. It is, uh, if it is Arabic or Farsi, that is, that is, they are very connected to each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me tell you a story. The, the, for a couple of weeks, I had done an installation in, uh, in a museum in Ghent, in um, a small city near to Brussels. Uh, the Museum of Fine Arts there, that's a wonderful, huge museum. Uh, the entrance hall of the museum, I did an installation I work, as uh, you said, uh, with calligraphy, but it is not, I write all the space, the floor, the walls, the roof, everything. But it is not a, a, a legible text that I write, it is just the rhythm of writing. And the whole space is redefined through this uh, writing. I had to do this work during the time that the museum was open, so many visitors came and uh, uh, to to the uh, and to this entrance hall. Uh, at one day, there were refugees coming with mm -hmm. their social worker. Mm -hmm. uh, some young men were among them; three of them from Syria. And um, how they react, I, it was so touching. And one, but I could not talk to them because I cannot speak Arabic. But there was also a man from Afghanistan mm -hmm. uh, speaking Farsi, the same language that I do. And he told me that from now on, whenever he feels homesick, he would come to this entrance hall and sit in the melody of the familiar words. And that was so touching. I thought that is, that is if, if art can do something like that, to open a space of belonging, that is, that is really great. Yes, so, yeah. So, uh, that of course I feel very much connected to this uh, refugees coming. I, and uh, I hope that uh, also through art, uh, my art, they, I can just uh, open spaces of understanding uh, for the people uh, not having this experience, but mm -hmm. also um, feeling of belonging for them. Because mm -hmm. if they see something here in cultural uh, uh, institutions that they feel it comes from my region. They feel some kind of belonging and that is very important. I know that from my own experience that you need uh, moments of belonging to, uh, to really feel that you, you can settle. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, your art, uh, you cannot exhibit it in, in uh, Iran. At that moment, uh, At the you moment, said you not. are persecuted <laughs> and you, your art is considered like uh, um, blasphemy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Could you explain the, the situation for you? Yeah. So, because um, I think it's a kind of a schizophrenic situation also. Yes. Because uh, in the best way, of mm. uh, it's a fragment uh, yes. life uh, because you live in both world, yes. worlds. In one, you are respect, uh, respected, mm -hmm. you exhibit, uh, you, you, mm. you are free, yes. you can help other people. Mm. Uh, and uh, in the other hand, when you go to Iran, mm. you remain always this experience. Yes. You keep your house in order to remain mm. it and uh, to other people, but at the same time you are, um, uh, you are persecuted and you are considered like, yes. a, like a danger. Yes. Could you, if you like, uh, yeah. to, to talk, uh, to explain? Yeah, us? as you said, uh, schizophrenia is actually a very good uh, definition of the situation because, um, and it is really sometimes, um, 
sad because, uh, of course, I, uh, I, I love to exhibit in Iran and I, somehow I feel very much connected to this country. This, it's the country where I, uh, uh, my whole childhood, uh, I can remember. Um, but um, when I go there, as you said, um, only the, situa the, the, the circumstances of being watched, you know, uh, that the police look at you, watch you, and you are not free to do uh, or act what you, how you like, or that is that is really horrible. But at the other hand, it is here in West. Um, I uh, I am respected for what I do, for my art. Next month, I start a residency in Swiss uh, for three months. That is that's a wonderful opportunity, and I'm very thankful for it. But it, it is at the same time thinking of my own country treating me like that. It makes me sometimes sad, but sometimes are very angry. You think, why don't you understand that uh, uh, that it is it is only about freedom of speech? What I'm talking about, it is not harming for for the country. It's mm -hmm. actually you are damaging the country as the government. But um, I try to balance it. It is not always easy. <laughs> it is not easy, but. I try to keep the contact to um, Iran and I have a lot of wonderful friends there. That helps. If you have people that you are connected to, if you have networks, especially in artist networks, uh, then uh, of course I have also family, but friends who are from my own profession, they, they are very important. Uh, keeping dialogue to them and uh, always confirming that there are people who understand what I am doing and they think it is good. Uh, that is something that uh, helps me a lot to deal with this situation. <coughs> are there some association uh, supporting you when, when you go to Tehran? To Iran? To Iran? Actually, um, there are not associations, they are networks. Uh -huh. It is because, you know, under this kind of repression and dictator, they cannot be, um, also the political parties are so on. They are so weak now uh, because of long term of uh, repression. But there are networks, networks of artists, networks of activists, they are always, uh, somehow you, you have to be very careful, you have to, uh, for example, uh, don't talk at telephone because it might be heard, it, everything, this kind of uh, being careful. <laughs> so it is, um, uh, it is difficult, but you have to take it easy. If you don't take it easy, they would make you more weak. <laughs> you have to uh, actually uh, always try to keep your sense of humor with this kind of situations. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, uh, dictators are horrible, but are, they are at the same time very funny. They are very silly. You can laugh at them. <laughs> And that is a good mm -hmm. attitude. You have to say, it is, it, you have to balance it. Of course, you cannot always laugh at them. They, they, sometimes it is not possible. But, mm -hmm. but what I have experienced is that a portion of sense of humor is always good. Mm -hmm. And you are exhibiting one of my books uh, here, Take Your Shoes Off. That is um, drawn, actually, that's my own experience of um, 
going to the judiciary system in Iran okay. and trying to bring the case of the murder of my parents to court. So it is always about take your shoes off, take your hands like that, do that, do this. And it has got a funny side. Mm -hmm. So that is the funny side I tried to draw. <laughs> And, uh, what's about uh, the situation of, uh, of, the, of the woman, of the woman that you know yeah. in, in Iran? Uh, they, um, are, they are fighting politically. Yes, in this, uh, yes. Uh, quite a strong you know, the, the women movement in Iran is actually very strong and that is mm -hmm. wonderful. That, mm -hmm. is, uh, that makes me really proud mm -hmm. and happy. But um, you have to know that um, uh, the Iranian women, by law, they are not equal to men. And that is everything about that. It is the, for a long time that the Iranian women are challenging this uh, situation that they are not equal to men through Islamic law that is uh, ruling the country. Uh, and uh, the way is that these laws are, have to be changed, but uh, not yet uh, mm -hmm. uh, su successful. But they, uh, as you have been also saying in the exhibition to the, through the tour, the Iranian women are not victims. They are doing their best mm -hmm. to challenge the situation. Also, if uh, through the law, they are not equal to men, but they try. And that is what uh, I think has to be seen and considered and respected. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, to finish, I would like to ask you, um, what do you think about the work of Gohar Dashti, who is also oh. in the exhibition, because yes. uh, you know her? Yes. And uh, could you tell to us uh, what you told me uh, before about mm -hmm. uh, the blood, the blood. The, this work yes. is low decay. Yes. And, uh, uh, you know, I uh, know Gohar, she, she's from a generation after me. So that is a generation that I have been looking at with uh, uh, great joy because there are really wonderful artists, also women artists mm -hmm. growing in, up in Iran and uh, she has become now um, internationally famous. It's wonderful to follow. And uh, um, the series that uh, you are showing here, you are showing diff two different series. One I had seen before, the other one, three different series. One was new for me with the blood. And um, you know this subtle, sub very, very, soft way of showing how uh, violence has been uh, gone through these uh, uh, societies really touching because um, I think that it is some kind of, it, I see it very much related to the uh, green movement in Iran, the uprising which was uh, very violently repressed through the, uh, through the uh, government. Uh, and uh, different um, artists reacted uh, or responded to this situation of being wounded. And I see that as, as some kind of a response as of the situation of being wounded. And also, there is a tension between in the relationship between man and woman in the, the frames. There is always a man and a woman, sometimes absent. The, 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 in the first frame, you see the man and the, only the, the, the cloth of the woman. And then the, the second one, the, the woman with the cloth, uh, with the mm -hmm. uh, coat of a man. And all these stories that you feel, but you cannot read all of it. This mystery, this storytelling, but 
not telling the whole thing and uh, that that uh, I liked it very much mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm happy that I could see the work uh, live here. It means that at the moment there are young artists who are taking yes. this uh, this fight, this resistance yes, also. Yes, a lot of. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. there are a lot of young artists now uh, who um, uh, work uh, very critically mm -hmm. to the political, social uh, situation, but they they choose not a direct way. Mm -hmm. They. Yes. They they find their ways, and that is very interesting to watch it, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. follow. Thank you. Thank you. I think that uh, you have uh, many similarities, Larissa, mm -hmm. in one hand, uh, coming from Palestine, you coming from Aidan, which are very different countries, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you live the experience of the exile, the migration uh, to live in another country, and you said uh, in an unknown country, and you have to learn a, another language, and you are always between, in between uh, different worlds, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the, there are these links uh, also yes. between you. And uh, I would like to ask you, Larissa, about your one experience in Palestine, and uh, your, your family memories, and uh, how did you uh, let, uh, leave your home? And uh, what is your experience um, about? Yeah, there, there are some similarities. And um, I, with the start of the Intifada, which is the uprising in 88, I had to um, leave Palestine because I was doing my high school and all schools closed, so I had to uh, move and uh, luckily my family actually was able to send me somewhere else and a lot of uh, kids in my class also were sent all over the world so it's just mm, another Palestinian experience of people living all over the world and um, so I left when I was 15 I left to London um, and my experience there was a little bit shocking, as you said, to, to move to a, a new country. Not because I didn't speak the language. I actually did study English when I, I went to school in Palestine. But um, uh, just because of the perception of what people thought of you as a Palestinian. And I think that's the kind of um, dichotomy or kind of... Um, maybe dynamics that I like to explore in my work because I grew up with mostly American television, uh, British television, French television, j because we didn't have a country. So everything that we got was from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So actually, most Palestinians know so much about the rest of the world. I mean, I grew up with American sitcoms, films, um, French talk shows, uh, English, uh, you know, comedy series. So I knew so much about the rest of the world uh, or those particular countries, but they didn't know, have a clue about who I was. They just thought I was probably, I don't know, some, some underprivileged person from... Mm -hmm. And that kind of like uh, uh, dynamics was quite interesting for me, how it was my responsibility to... Uh, kind of inform uh, a West, like Western audience of who I was, though I, I was the underprivileged. So it's kind of like uh, I was thought of being the victim, yet I was the one who was responsible for um, kind of explaining who I was. Um, so I think that kind of shows a lot in my work and how I try to use a language that's kind of um, you know, immersed in pop culture and uh, film and uh, maybe things that people might think are Western, say, uh, you know, uh, language. But for me, it's not even Western. It's what I grew up with myself. So it's in a way saying I have the right to use that language as well because uh, I'm a product of, of, of this. Um, at the same time, I feel like um, the Palestinian question is not really something that about a certain people who have a certain problem. It's not locally, uh, doesn't pertain to a local uh, problem. It is a 
a problem that we know how history unfolded and what it created. And therefore, it's a universal problem that we all need to uh, understand and care about. And it's, um, I think it's, it's, it's a problem that is affecting a lot of what's going on in the region right now. So it's, it's nothing to think that it belongs to another people. It's, it, it is a problem that we all have to be concerned with. Um, so, and I, I think that kind of uh, concern had to be played in a way that uh, wasn't just what I saw in, say, news footage or how, what, what frustrated me living abroad and hearing what was happening in Palestine was, I, of, of course, I, I could get the news from my, on the phone from my friends and family because my family still lived in Palestine. And it was completely different from the news that was shown in, uh, in America. I lived in America for eight years and, I, which, uh, and, and in Europe for, I don't know, more, 15 years. So the, the news was always just shocking how it was getting reported and what was really going on. And that, of course, I started understanding how much um, influence um, the, the news has, like it, how much it, it gets from the sources it, it, it was allowed to, to have. So, for example, things that I didn't know was that the journalists, when they come to Palestine, they cannot stay in in Palestine because, according to their government, it's dangerous territory. So they stay in Israel. So their sources are actually Israeli. So they, so the idea that we're getting objective news is to be questioned as well, because like, you get a lot of help from the sources, local sources. Mm -hmm. Um, we also, uh, my mother used to rent our house um, to the UN, pe people who worked in the UN, and um, because Bethlehem is relatively a safer place than other parts of Palestine. Um, the, the, and my mother is Russian, so the UN uh, people would ask my mother, what happened today in Bethlehem? Was just to show you how ridiculous the whole process is. They're asking a Russian who lives in Palestine what mm. is really happening locally right now. And that's how what they report back. So um, to think that everything is really like as, um, you know, as hunky-dory as we'd like, it to, to, like to believe it is not really the case. And, um, and often I like to show how absurd certain situations are in my work. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I have some visuals as well. Yes, uh, <laughs> we would like to know about your, your work. Uh, what are you working at the moment? And uh, if you, we could uh, project. Yeah, that would works, be nice. And yeah. uh, if you could uh, do a sign when you want to change the yeah. images to the, to the people there, please. Um, so I showed with uh, the artist Santiago Sierra recently, mm -hmm. uh -huh. and the, he showed a work that I'm actually, the first slide relates to his work. Mm -hmm. um, and his work was um, planting, sitting, maybe not in was planting the anarchist. Um, Podemos empezar, por favor, con las proyecciones. Would you like to sit? Yeah, maybe after this, that would be the best. We could move a little bit. Uh, it's, not, it's not the film, I just want to show an image. No, uh, your works. Yeah, they're showing the film, though. Ah, uh, Por favor, son las proyecciones de las imágenes, no el film. Todavía no. So, um, yeah, not this one. Um, th they're not going in the right yes. direction, but it's okay. Um, maybe we'll see it later. Uh, this one, can we stay on this one? Uh, so I, sh I showed with Santiago Sierra, and he had this work of um, planting a black flag, the anarchist flag, on the North Pole and the South Pole. And I think 
it just shows how different the concerns are between what a Palestinian needs and what uh, is, is considered also a very valid concern of what are borders, what are national borders. Mm -hmm. But if you've never had a country and you've not, not even considered the number, you re start realizing how important it is to even have that number. Uh, uh, so it's kind of idealistic to think of beyond borders before you even have self-determination. Um, so in this work, uh, you see me planting the, um, the Palestinian flag on the moon. And it's kind of like a comment on it's much easier to reach the moon for a Palestinian than to reach uh, Jerusalem because it starts of me trying to get to Jerusalem where I was born, but I could never get there. Mm -hmm. So nationalism and what it means in different contexts, it plays a big role in my work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can we see the next one, please? Siguiente. Was it um, nation state? N yeah, I'm trying to get to na nation state. Uh, yeah. could, uh, Podemos volver otra vez, por favor, a la primera. Yeah, so this one is the one that's playing in the exhibition right now, and it's uh, also very much about building a nation and what it means to have a nation. Is it really a nation if you are an open-air prison and in, the, in this very high-tech uh, skyscraper? And in this film, I also um, had a lot of nationalist symbols, like the Palestinian kefir, the... Uh, folkloric images, the, even the Palestinian flag, um, um, all sorts of things that you associate with Palestine. And for me, that also started uh, creating doubt as to what really is Palestine if it really is, if you take the resistance out of it. If all this symbolism is taken out of the equation, then they're just empty symbols that belong into a kind of a museum. Um, and a nation state they were kind of symbols that were like empty vessels that in, exist in this very big building that, uh, that has lost its meaning. And which brings me to the next slide, please. La siguiente. Um, of using these patterns, like the Palestinian uh, kefir that you see me eating from in, in nation state and reactivating them so that actually these symbols start meaning something. So um, I actually took these and, and have a performance where I uh, take these plates and I bury them in various parts of Palestine and Israel for future archaeologists to find. So basically if you if the Palestinian uh, self-determination doesn't happen now, maybe archaeologists in the future will mm -hmm. determine that these people really did exist. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the film that I'll be showing uh, mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I have other slides, but um, maybe we can see. Uh, in this film, you, you follow a... This is when I buried uh, various plates in, in Palestine. And in, in the film, you see um, this project um, run by a, um, a rebel leader who calls herself a, narr a, ter a narrative terrorist. So she's basically trying to change the narrative history of the region by taking academics into her own hands and becoming actually an activist. Uh, so it's also a criticism of academia and how we live in our own bottled wor world. Um, um, in, in this film, obviously, her um, resistance idea is taken to levels of um, a, a very glamorous levels where she actually employs spaceships uh, uh, of, that bring down all these uh, porcelain uh, to dig all over. So it's kind of questions the idea of uh, the sanity of the whole project, but maybe we can talk about it after the film. Yeah. Okay. Okay, if you like now we screen the film yes. and then uh, also uh, you can uh, uh, make some questions to Larissa and to Paras too. Okay. <coughs> Vemos el, uh, el video, por favor.
apagamos. Eh, ¿Podríamos apagar la مرات بحلم بصحوني بتوقع من السماء بحلم فيها كأنها مطر من فخار بالأول بتمطر شوي شوي بس أكا من شقة بهبط على الأرض زي ورق الخريف بشوف حالي في هذا المشهد مستمتعة فيه بهدوء بس بعدين عددهم بزيد بتحول العاصر من خزف تضرب في الأرض مثل الطاعون في زمن الثورة شو بتفكري هذا بعني؟ ما أظن أن هذا المشهد إلى معنى هو مجرد صورة خيالية شي بتحبي تحكي عنه اذا في قوليلي مثل شو يعني اختك مثلا اساسا انا فكرت احنا جايين نحكي عنها اليوم الأمر اللي صدر إنك مطلوب للاعتقال مش غريب إنه الواحد يكون مطلوب للاعتقال هاي الأيام بس إنتوا بتوصفوا حالكم كميليشيا روائية هيك تسمية رح تعرضكم للخطر طبعاً مش في الصحراء تتذكري 
انت مرتاحة هيك؟ أنا مرتاحة هيك عن شو كنا نحكي؟ كنت تحكي عن كيف دفنوك بقصد في مشروعك مظبوط أنا كتير مرات بشوف نفسي في المستقبل بشوف حالي مكفنة بقماش على فراش الموت جسمي كله سخن وبرتعش وبترك صورتي على قماش زي كيف انتورين بس كفني هو الحضارة اللي أنا صنعتها إحنا إحنا لسه ما أتقنا تماما كيف نطلع باختبار الكربون بعمر عظامي رح يكشف حقيقة التاريخ اللي أنا عم بصنع بس المستقبل اللي انت بتتخيليه هو مجرد يوتوبيا جدلية صح؟ بالنسبة إلك كل المسائل هي معادلات أكاديمية بس أنا مش جاي أقدم مطروح إحنا عم نزرع بقائع في الأرض في المستقبل لما علماء الآثار يكتشفوها رح تكون هي برهان على إنه هذا الشعب اللي إحنا عم نتركه اليوم كان موجود يعني أنت بدك إنه الأجيال الجاي تلاقي برهان على إنه هاي كانت أرض جدودهم أنت عم تخلقي شعب كل أفعالنا هي تدخل في التاريخ أنا اخترت أتسلل بين سرديب موت الماضي وعم بترك علامات على كل الجدران اللي في طريقي فأنت عم تعمل اللي بتعمليه عشان تثبتي إنه الميثولوجيا بتكون تاريخ والأحداث السياسية أنت عم تحكي وكأن حكينا في هذا الموضوع من قبل وأنت شو رأيك؟ تفكري احنا حكينا في هذا الموضوع اعتمد على شو على اذا كنت حقيقي الشخص اللي بتدعي انك هو انت ماتت وهي صغيرة كان عمرها تسع سنين بس هم يفكروها شيء ثاني من ما عمرهم فهموا شو قتلت 
كان ممكن هي تكون انت في نقطة لما تتجاوزيها الموت بيبطل إلها علاقة بحياة فرد واحد بيبطل إشي شخصي وجودنا الجماعي هو اللي بخلينا كلنا أهداف بس أكيد مش معقول إنك بتفكري بموت أختك بهاي الطريقة العلمية أنا بضلني ألاحظ فيها بس هي دائما سبقتني بعدة خطوات مرات بحس كأني عادة ألاحظ فينا الاثنين كأنه أنتوا التنتين ميتين مش متأكدة مش متأكدة إذا لازم نلاقي معالي من هالشكل إحنا هلا عايشين في ديستوبيا ومنضلنا نغرق في أعماق الكارثة إحنا عايشين في بؤرة تسارع الأحداث باتجاه نهاية العالم كل شي حوالينا بيختفي شوي شوي هاي أكثر صفة مرعبة من صفات النهاية نهاية العالم ما بتيجي على غفلة زي الزلزال بتتسلل علينا شوي شوي كل اللي بتذكره انه احنا دايما عايشين في عصر الاختفاء حدا نهبنا والنهب ما كان بس مادي الريحة المشهد وهم شي قدرتنا على الحركة والتحول كله راح بس هدول الناس اللي راح يطابوا بارض اسلافهم الخياليه والعمرهم راح يصيروا موجودين بس هم راح يوجدوا الأسطورة تخلق واقع تخلق هوية الناس راح تنضم وتعلن انتماء أكيد بطالب الناس اللي من سلالة الموجودين هون اليوم الناس اللي من لحم ودمهم رح يكون إلها أكثر شرعية المسألة مش مسألة شرعية الحاكمين من زمان أمونا من المعادلة أنا بس عم بزيد أرقام يعني بحاول أخرب حسابات بس لما تطرحي هذا الشعب المزيف مش كأنك تتقبلي هلاك شعبك بالعكس هم احنا واحنا هم لانهم رح يتعبوا بالارض باسمنا اصلا وجودنا نفسه بيحدد الخيال المفروض علينا الناس اللي حاكمين اختاروا يشوفونا غايبين تدربوا بصرهم كيف يتجنبوا الواقع هم بلاحظونا بس لما بنتمرد عليهم لما بنسكت بنبطل موجودين هم شافوا اختك غايبه لا شافوها ومن خلالها شافونا كلنا شافوا كل شيء
ليش اخترتي علم الاثار كساحة المعركة؟ هاي كانت واحدة من الجبهات من الاساس اللي حكمونا بنى هويتهم معتمدين على الاثار ما عاد في لزوم للتاريخ ها هي اداة التعريف اللي اختاروها عشان يخلقوا وهم وهم متجانس وظيفة علم الآثار هي أنه يفسر الماضي بشكل يعطي حاضر استحقاق تاريخي طريقة ذكية بس هاي الطريقة مش علمية الدقة العلمية ما إلهاش علاقة أنا بس بحاول أفهم علم الآثار سهل أنه ينحرف عن الهدف ويصير أداة لحشة الجماهير أداة بتدعم الأساطير وبتدافع عنها في حالة إذا صار هناك مواجهة مع العلم هلا احنا رح نصير جزء من هاي الباب بس ليش الخزف؟ الفخار دائما الى صلة مع فكرتنا عن الماضي كل حضارة عندها اواني الحضارة اللي انا بدي اصنعها اوانيها من الخزف وكل حضارة لازم كمان يتلاقى عندها هياكل عضوية لجدودها بس احنا لحد هلا ما دفن كيف قدرتوا انه تتلاعبوا بامر قطع الفخار؟ الموضوع مش بسيط بس برضه مش علم صاروخ. اي قطعه فخاريه مدفونه في الارض بتمتص كميه من المي والاشعه بمعدل ثابت مع مر الزمن. عمليه تقدير عمر كل قطعه بعتمد على قياس هاي المعايير. فاذا قدرنا نشبعها بكميه كبيره من الاثنين ممكن نضيف مئات السنين لعمرها. طريقة التأريخ باستعمال الكربون الأساليب اللي إحنا بنتبعها لسه مش موثوق فيها ورح نضطر نعمل كمان تجارب لما يتوفر عنا جثث لهذا الغرض وطبعا هدول رح نعالجهم ليتوزعوا على عدة عصور بتخيل رح تواجهي صعوبة لقمة طوعية تحبي تتطوعي؟ شو دورها في هالموضوع؟ معظم أفعالنا الجذرية مصدرها الصدمات النفسية لما أنت بتلاحي أختك عمرك تزقطيها؟ مرات حتى هي بتشوفنا معينة بحس انها
اما مستوعب انها مش قادره تتعرف علي هي ما بتقدر تحاول المستقبل ما بتقدر هاي هي مشكلتي مش هيك انت مكرسه حياتك تفاوضي الماضي وتفاوضي المستقبل وبتحاولي تغيري الاثنين بس هذا مستحيل انا مش متوقع المستقبل ولا الماضي يردوا علي بسرعه امتى انت مخططة انك تشوفي مش مهم امتى المهم انه يكتشفوا حتى لو بعد مئة سنة فاذا في المستقبل الناس راح تكتشف انه حضارتك هاي اهلك كانوا يأكلوا من ارقى انواع الخبز مزبوط وقتها بس الأيام ما بتصير في لحظة زمن مرات أحلم بسهولة بتوقع من السم أحلم فيها كأنها مطر من الفخار في الأول بتمطر شوي شوي بس أكم شقفة بهبط على الأرض زي ورق الخريف بشوف حالي في هذا المشهد مستمتعة فيه بهدوء بس بعدين عددهم بزيد بتحول العاصف من الخزن تضرب في الأرض مثل الطاعون في زمن الثورة
para esto. ¿Podemos regular las luces, por favor? These are very strong images uh, about uh, British colonialism and uh, spoiled uh, lands and uh, between memory, identity, tradition and uh, it's uh, very... At the, at the same moment uh, in this film uh, you feel the, the role of this woman, of that woman who is in... Um, She's completely uh, alone also. And uh, w w uh, what were your motivations and uh, your relationship with Palestine uh, and uh, to, to produce this film uh, and your subjective and uh, personal identity with this film? Uh, I think there were many. And I think what I really like about the art form is that it even things that you're not even uh, aware of <laughs> come up and you know that it's very important for you to have a certain scene and then only later do you start realizing why and that's why I think other than poetry for example language has a it restricts that kind of memory or that kind of image making and I think art has this way of kind of reaching in a subconscious that you yourself you know are unaware of and so there are so many different layers to the film and I can only talk about what I have been really kind of conscious of. But sometimes what I find interesting is that I do find a new nuances that I, I wasn't aware of before. Um, but again, it, um, when, when you have an, an identity that has, been, has experienced trauma, then you start realizing that um, there's so much of the associations that you have of, of that identity and what it means that are just kind of disassociated from your even living experience or your immediate experience. Um, and that's why it was important for me to have uh, an anachronism in the film. So time really had to kind of only make sense when you, you view it in terms of the present being enveloped in the past and the future. Because in order to understand what's happening in, in Palestine, you have to understand its past. So a lot of the past that I have is from archival imagery and footage. And the more I found myself looking at this, at this imagery, the more I realized that I'm actually intervening in this imagery. I'm making my own interpretation of what they really are. And that's what we always do when we look at archives as well. So that was important for me. How do we intervene? Even if we think that we are having kind of a calm or a, an unaffected way of looking at an image. We always put a, a meaning to it. And so that's how we also understand history. Who, who does tell that history? How do we understand that history? Um, and what I find interesting about sci-fi is that it kind of echoes the Palestinian condition in a good way, where you often... Um, the Palestinian trauma is kind of embedded in this idea that we have lost our country, the country of, uh, that was taken from us in 1948, and uh, that we live in that tragic moment of um, the Nakba, the cat, which means the catastrophe of 1948 when the State of Israel was formed. Um, yet I always try to understand what this idea of home home means because if I, if I think that the occupation no longer existed or what is home, then it's, home could never really be kind of restored back to what it was before. What was this tact, tactful, tact, uh, uh, intact home that we know? And that was when the future comes uh, into picture. What do we project for Palestine as a future? And that always is like the sci-fi condition of uh, when I was trying to do a nation state, a building that looked more futuristic than the cliche futuristic film, it stopped looking like the future. So it's kind of, 
it's stuck in this limbo of being uh, a construct of what modernism really looks and what um, and a, a future projection of what it wants to be. And so that play, formally that plays well in, in what I'm, I'm trying to address. Um, I think the central part of the film is the, the rebel leader and her sister, because she had a sister that died young. And that kind of became like a, a, a symbol of, or kind of like a bigger metaphor for uh, how you're trying to negotiate the future with, with something that already you lost. And it reminded me of a, this figure in uh, Orwell's 1984 who was trying to communicate with the future. So he's writing to the future, then he gets lost because he didn't know how to write to the future. Because he says, if the future uh, looks the same, it wouldn't want to listen to me. But if the future looks different, then it wouldn't understand what I'm saying. And in the film, you see that her sister <coughs> looks at her and she just, unlike her, she doesn't understand what, who she was because she looks different. Mm -hmm. um, so th there are lots of you know, topics at play in the film. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Um, now, I would like uh, to give the word to the public here mm -hmm. if uh, they want uh, to make some questions to you. Nos gustaría ahora que intervinieran con algunas preguntas para tú, Larisa, sobre la exposición que han hecho de su arte, de su vida, de sus países. Okay. <laughs> I, I think um, we would uh, differently answer this question because it is completely different situations. Uh, she's talking about not having a country and me, uh, there is a country. Uh, if I think that I, how much I do belong there, I don't know. Uh, it is not also an interesting question for me, actually. It is uh, 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 looking at my biography, I, am, I don't belong that much there. I, don't, I, I live s somewhere in between and I would keep that. If I go back there and want to stay there, I don't know if, I, if it is interesting for me. But how much hope I do have that the, the situation there comes to better. Um, sometimes a lot, sometimes not that much. <laughs> it is also, you know, it depends on the political situation. If you look at the world now, I don't think um, that there are, it's, it's a horrible situation now, not only, not only there. It is everywhere, there is some kind of crisis going on in the world. So I think that um, uh, I cannot be that much of optimistic, but I can be hopeful because I think that there are always, there's also another part of the world that tries to make it a better world. And that is where I put my hope on and try to to, to be part of it, but um, uh, I don't know, I don't see the, in anything that much of optimistic now. <laughs> um, I, well, I do go back to, home, I do go back to Palestine, so I can't, I can't. 
Um, and I tried to live there for a longer time. And I like living there. There's something very nice about being in Palestine. It's good weather, good food. <laughs> um, I, I like the sense of how close people are and the fact that there is a people that are resisting something gives you energy because you are, there is a cause, there is something that everybody unites to, to fight. At the same time, when I go um, back, I'm only allowed to stay in Bethlehem where I'm from. So traveling from one Palestinian city to another, it becomes extremely difficult. So I sometimes feel like if I really want to be more reasonable and kind of more productive in what I do art-wise, I actually uh, have better resources if I live somewhere else than in Palestine. Because in Palestine, even the internet doesn't work very well for various reasons, like, um, very much due to occupation. But um, so I feel like I'm uh, this in a disadvantaged position being in Palestine because I'm unable to help as much as I could if I lived abroad. Um, yeah, and, and obviously you always live in a sense of fear when you're there because you have, you're constantly crossing checkpoints with Israelis with machine guns pointing their guns at you. So you're always paranoid, you're always in this state of fear. Um, Am I hopeful? I think with the Trump government, it's just going to get worse because um, it's, uh, he's completely unaware of what's going on. I mean, recently he told Netanyahu, uh, do you want one state, two states, whatever you want, whatever makes you happy. I mean, uh, this is not a presidential language. This is a president that doesn't know how to, uh, to speak or, or understand what's at stake for, he represents a government that's been working on a two-state solution for such a long time, and then he just, in a, blatantly, in a, in a, a press conference just says that. So it, that doesn't make me very hopeful. Pardon? Eh, en Palestina, eh, la situación de la mujer es similar a la de los... En Palestina, la situación de la mujer es similar a la de otros países islámicos. Hay más igualdad, eh, no existe la igualdad. Eh, el hecho religioso sigue siendo importante, es muy importante y determina la vida de la sociedad y sus normas y reglas, o se puede considerar que es, está en otro nivel? Um, well, first of all, we don't have a government that kind of issues laws that um, say uh, repress women because we just don't have that country. Uh, so you have a, I have a hard time comparing that with other um, Islamic countries. Second of all, uh, Palestine is the home that uh, I consider it the first cosmopolitan uh, country in the, in, or region in, uh, in the world where all three Bibli um, religions of the book are, came from there. So Islam, Christianity, and uh, Judaism uh, all kind of centered in, in there. So there aren't uh, only Muslims that live there. I, I come from a Christian family, um, and there are Jewish Palestinians as well, so it's not a question of religion, really. Uh, but of course, there's a, a big Muslim community as well in Palestine. Uh, before um, the complete collapse of, uh, and b before the Intifada, I never saw anyone, say, from the Muslim community that even wore the hijab. Um, I think fanaticism on all levels, on, on, in all religions in Palestine, just got accentuated because it became kind of immersed or merged into uh, political resistance. So it's actually the situation is becoming worse just because people are using religion as some form of identity that has, hasn't been there before. Um, so I think 
images of, like, say, resistance uh, movements from the 70s in Palestine that were all very secular, quite communist, actually, now has been replaced with, you know, Hamas pictures of, you know, uh, Muslim resistance. Uh, and that is quite unfortunate. But I don't think culturally Palestine comes from a place where women are oppressed. So I think only if you start thinking about fanaticism and uh, what it does uh, uh, for all religions. Because if you, if you think about, say, we, we keep thinking about like Islam when we talk about fanaticism. And, and it's quite important for me as a Christian person to accentuate that actually, on the other hand, with, with Orthodox Jews, it's complete fanaticism and women have no rights whatsoever. I mean, uh, women are like the, the really, really badly treated in Judaism. So, so for me to keep focusing on Islam as being that monstrous religion is, is quite hard to stomach since I come from a Christian community and I belong to the bigger Arabic community. So I don't want to kind of start pointing fingers on, uh, on, on certain religions <coughs> being more oppressive to women. But yeah, of course, I think it's not religion. I think it's, it's the... It's using religion as your political message. And unfortunately, maybe you, you see that more often in, in countries that have been abused and actually um, have ha, um, need to come with a resistance movement. And unfortunately, that's how the whole thing got mixed. And, and of course, women get suppressed uh, with that. <coughs> Siempre las minorías ultrarreligiosas fanáticas condicionan la vida política, tanto en Israel como puede ser en Palestina. ¿no? Pero en general, en la sociedad palestina, eh, la mujer vive con eh, cierta igualdad, con desigualdad en términos sociales, jurídicos... Uh, well, I can't speak in legal terms because we don't have a country, you know, so um, so we, there is no, like, law that oppresses women or... Um, I think, like, with any kind of uh, society that's more traditional, women are more oppressed than men. So, for example, even, like, in, in northern European countries like Scandinavia, I think women are much more liberated than, like, southern countries in Europe. So it's all relative. and they're even more suppressed in like, uh, like you know, the Arab world. Um, I think when we talk about like very blatant suppression, so when we, you start um, oppressing women by law, and that becomes problematic. So I think in Palestine, the thing is that it's not really, there, because there is no country, it's very hard to, but I would say it's a traditional country. Um, it's a traditional country where, yeah, it is, um, you know, male ruled, yet at the same time, I think women rule at home. So it's kind of, it's a very kind of schizophrenic, weird way. And you have many um, uh, Palestinian women politicians who represent Palestine that you see on the news all the time. So it's kind of like, yeah, it is maybe a, a male ruled society, but if women want, want to do whatever they want, they can do it. It's not, it's, uh, it's not like, uh, because you cannot put a woman in prison if she does anything. There is no kind of suppression of that sort. Sí, yo quería saber si con el tema de la arqueología lo que pretendes hacer es cuestionar que eso eh, pueda servir de base para la reivindicación de una nación o de un Estado. No sé si me explico. A veces ¿no? eh, fundamentamos los hechos en que, no, es que nosotros hemos vivido aquí desde no sé cuándo, tal cual, y lo demostramos, yo pues sé qué, pues eh, sacando cosas de la antigüedad, ¿no? Es decir, que eso a veces forma parte del cuestionamiento eh, para la defensa de una nación o de un... ¿Tú eso lo planteas ahí como, como un vacile a esa idea? No sé, ¿me explico? 
Si quieres decir como que la arqueología legitima, Eso. y en el caso del Estado de Israel también, sí, sí, legitima no, todo, la, todo, la, la nación, la reivindicación de una nación y de una identidad sí, sí. para expoliar o expropiar al otro de su tierra también. ¿no? Sí. Es algo que está en el film. ¿no? Sí. Uh, I think archaeology is quite interesting because I've never seen it as breaking news as in like uh, Israeli newspapers. Breaking news, they found an object that proves that, you know, Jewish people belong to that land. So the idea is of using archaeology um, or instrumentalizing archaeology as a, or using it as a political tool to your end kind of defines the academic nature of archaeology. So it's used not as an epistemological tool, but it's used for that political end. And that was why uh, archaeology played a big role in the film. Um, so it, it kind of used it as, uh, you know, to illustrate that this rebel leader wants to prove something and therefore she can just manipulate the archaeology and prove it. So she's using carbon dating to change, the, you know, the age of those porcelain plates and and that is something that I presented it presented this film in an archaeology department at UCL University in London and an archaeologist surprisingly tells me well you know we can do that now we can change that <laughs> I was like oh I didn't know but apparently that is done and then uh, also uh, if you remember a part with the shroud of Turin where we we always I think, or supposedly, it's the shroud where Jesus was kind of wrapped in, uh, when he, after he was taken down from the cross. But it was um, discovered, uh, I don't know when it was discovered, uh, at a later stage that actually this shroud belonged, um, if you carbon dated it, to the Middle Ages. Uh, so it's, it's how do we manipulate history, who tells history, and, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was very surprised when uh, last year you said that uh, your land, uh, family's land was uh, expropriated by, uh, by the government, uh, Israeli uh, government, because uh, I thought that it was uh, especially a conflict between uh, Jews and uh, Muslims, but uh, you are Christian. And um, that's, uh, I think now that uh, the conflict is uh, about the territory. It's not uh, between religions. Yeah. What do you think about this? Because you, you, were, you were expropriated also. Yeah. And, uh, uh, so you yeah, were I, Muslim. I, I come from a Christian family, but I've been as oppressed as anyone else. You know, mm -hmm. For Israel, it doesn't matter what religion you are. You are come from mm -hmm. a territory where they want to take your land and mm -hmm. can you just please leave, you know? <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, and there were lots of uh, Palestinian Jews that w lived in Palestine. 6% of Palestinians were Jewish before Israel mm -hmm. was formed. And a lot of uh, these Arab Jews actually left Palestine when the Israel was formed because they were afraid of the European Jews because European Jewish identity is quite interesting uh, as it's, um, it kind of wants to separate itself from Europe, yet in the Middle East it wants to say we are European. Mm. So we're dealing with a very strange identity also in, in trauma. Um, mm -hmm. But so for, for Israel, anybody who's Arabic is, uh, is seen as an enemy. So, so it doesn't matter what religion okay. you are. Yeah. Okay, it's not only a conflict between religions. Uh, it's, it's, I don't think, it's a, it's a colonial project that, okay. uh, it's a, it's mm -hmm. used, it, it started as a secular modernist project for uh, the Jewish people who are obviously uh, uh, um, had a completely crazy tro um, history in Germany and obviously I completely understand that uh, the Jewish uh, mm -hmm. people needed uh, self-determination and nation, but that nation uh, was debated for a while as to where it, want, it, it needed to be, and even at some point um, there was a plan to have the state of Israel in Argentina. Mm -hmm. So the fact that um, it, was, it, it actually uh, ended up being in Israel was because this history was traced back to, well, we originally come from Israel, but do, do 
the European Jews have a history with that particular land, uh, it's quite debatable. So, um, so that, that's why it makes the whole thing quite complicated. Okay. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. I see. Bien. Um, thank you, Palas too. Thank you, Larissa, for sharing with us your life memories and uh, your art and resistance. And uh, muchas gracias a todas, todos vosotros por vuestra presencia, vuestra escucha y hasta, hasta siempre, hasta la próxima vez.